Okay. Thank you, Nader. Uh, yeah, so I will be talking about neurosur neurosurgical targets for chronic pain. And uh, essentially the content of my talk, so I'll touch base on uh, some of the approach that we have for cortical stimulation, uh, and then uh, the more invasive DBS approaches in the uh, subcortical space. Uh, and then you can see here the typical targets, so the uh, motor cortex stimulation on the cortical side, uh, the subcortical stimulation, uh, pretty familiar with uh, periventricular gray stimulation for endogenous uh, opioid stimulation, as well as the sensory thalamus. Uh, and then I'll touch upon some novel targets, uh, including the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, which uh, traditionally was a lesional target, uh, as well as pot new potential targets. Um, and, you know, so obviously the uh, stimulation um, for chronic pain, it's been uh, a little bit of a uh, frustrating field. Uh, at the beginning, it was one of the first uh, applications of DBS and neurostimulation, and there was a lot of hope to it. Uh, but as you may remember, Medtronic uh, ran a few trials, at least two trials, one with uh, an older generation of the device, and then uh, towards the end of that trial, they rolled over towards like the newer, uh, newer technology that's uh, the one that we currently have. And uh, those trials were both uh, stopped early because of a lack of e efficacy. Um, and so we're still doing those procedures nowadays for patients uh, that have reached the end and essentially have no other options. Uh, but it does remain frustrating where, like you, I'll show some of the numbers, uh, but it seems that we're pretty much stuck around like 40, 50 percent efficacy, generally speaking. Uh, and I think that's what the field where we're moving to now is like trying to refocus on a model of pain. Uh, and one of the model that's the most popular currently, it's this model of neural matrix. Uh, so that's being developed by uh, Ron Melzack uh, from uh, McGill actually, who came up initially with the uh, gate control theory of pain that gave rise to uh, spinal cord stimulation. And uh, so it's a relatively simple model, uh, but his idea is that we have uh, these uh, neurocircuitry uh, feedback loop and rever reverberary uh, circuit between the cortex and the thalamus and between the cortex and the limbic system, uh, constantly uh, shuffling information back and forth between, uh, between those regions. And essentially the general idea there is to move away from the uh, idea that pain is only a sensory experience. Um, and so it gets a little bit more complicated, but the, uh, uh, at the center of it, uh, he calls something the body self uh, neural matrix. And uh, so that theory uh, originates from phantom limb pain. So his idea is like, why do we have like phantom limb pain, right? So like the limb is gone. And so his idea is that there's a general uh, neural representation of the, of the body that he refers to as a body self. And the input to that are on the left side, uh, where it's the sensory uh, input, uh, as we all know, but he's adding additional layers to that, the cognitive portion of it. Uh, so that's the experience uh, that, you, that you bring in uh, to the pain sensation, your memories, uh, your past experience, essentially, as well as your social uh, history, uh, so cultural difference into the experience of pain. Uh, and at the bottom layer, you can see the uh, motivational or affective portion uh, component of pain. And so uh, this gives rise to the pain perception on a sensory basis as well as the action and the stress response. Uh, so this is very conceptual level uh, model and it's hard to encapsulate that on the neuromodulation side. Um, and so I try to put it into organic terms, into anatomy, so where we can start doing something about it. And so you can see here at the top would be our cortical layers. And so these are some of the pathways that have been uh, uh, illustrated as being involved in pain. And you can see how like the, the cortex obviously does have, uh, as shown by functional neuroimaging, uh, and DTI, uh, some closed loop with the thalamus. And on this portion of it, you can see the effective component uh, that's involved in pain. And so it does seem that there is reverberatory circuits uh, be connecting the cortical surface to the thalamus that are important in pain, as well as connecting the thalamus to the uh, limbic system uh, that are also uh, involved in pain. And so those circuits uh, give rise to descending uh, mod modulation circuits 
going through the uh, periaqueductal gray or periventricular gray. And uh, this is connected to the spine to try to modulate uh, the amount of sensory information that arises from the body to reach uh, the, the consciousness. Uh, and I highlighted in red some of the uh, typical targets. And so you can see that it starts to make sense uh, that uh, we are already targeting some of those uh, areas of this model. So like the motor cortex, uh, we're going to be touching just briefly upon the anterior cingulate uh, cortex. Uh, the thalamus, which is one of the main targets, and the periaqueductal gray. Uh, some of the other targets that are not highlighted here, I think represent uh, potential uh, targets in the future uh, where we, we could do research and see if they could have better efficacy uh, for specific patients. Uh, and I think that the idea is that we're probably going to eventually going to be moving away from uh, the concept that there is one target uh, generally for pain. Uh, and more of an individualized uh, therapy for pain. Uh, hopefully with the help of functional neuroimaging to guide the therapy for a specific patient depending on their symptoms as well as their neurocircuitry. Uh, and so looking more into implementing the neural matrix and neuromodulation. So I came up with this uh, general um, concept uh, where you would have a, a stimulus, uh, generally speaking, that would hit the thalamus, so like the VPL and the VPM for the face. Uh, and then you would have uh, pain that's generated from that. Uh, so that's a simple idea, but the uh, general concept would be that the thalamus is being modulated by higher sensory uh, level and a higher level of control. So imagine that you have a population of cells in the thalamus that controls pain. So it predominantly fires uh, when there's enough sensory input to generate pain, so an interpretation of pain. And contrary to that, you would have another uh, group of cells that would be um, controlling that uh, to as a relief uh, type of neurons. So these cells would be firing to tell the brain, listen, this is too much uh, sensory input. This should not be considered as a painful stimulation. And so it would be a battle between the two. And so this will allow higher control, uh, higher order control to modulate the thalamus to see whether or not a stimulus will lead to pain or not. Uh, so some of those higher control, as uh, the neural matrix uh, theory tells us, would be coming from the limbic system. Uh, so the anterior cingulate uh, cortex, uh, the amygdala, so whether or not there's like fear in your environment, so that can influence whether or not you're going to perceive pain. And the hippocampus, so it was, uh, you know, we all know that if you have a painful sensation in the past and then you're about to see the same stimulus coming at you, uh, so it's more likely that you'll experience pain with the stimulation. In fact, they did some experience where uh, people, you know, placed in the functional MRI would have the same regions of the brain uh, firing out uh, if they only see somebody being exposed to a painful stimulus. So it seems that, you know, our circuitry is built in such a way that if we expect pain based on memory or prior experience, the circuitry is already biased towards generating pain. Uh, and then on the other side, you would have uh, the cortical higher order areas, like the visual, so like the input coming from the stimulation, as well as the uh, prefrontal cortex and the insula that would also modulate uh, the thalamus uh, to essentially raise or decrease the threshold whether or not a sensation is going to be perceived as painful. Uh, and the periventricular gray is kind of squeezed in between and, and does receive the same input uh, from the limbic system, the cortical system, and then modulates some regions of the thalamus. Uh, again, to change that, that threshold. And so as we look at, uh, on this model, now we sort of have an, a general gist or a general idea of how we can start modulating not only the thalamus, uh, but also other areas like the limbic system and a cortical system so that uh, indirectly we can affect how the thalamus perceives a sensation and bias uh, it in such a way that the sensation is not perceived as painful. Uh, so now moving on to the cortical stimulation. Um, so this, the application of uh, stimulation for the motor cortex has to be done uh, contralateral to where the painful sensation is. Uh, this was first described in uh, 1991, and uh, it's predominantly applied for a neuropathic or central pain syndrome, so very difficult to treat uh, painful stimulation such as uh, complex facial pain, uh, phantom limb pain, uh, diaphant, diaphragm pain syndrome. Uh, the the uh, interesting part with motor cortex is since it's very close to the surface uh, and away from the temporalis muscle, 
uh, we, there are different modalities than invasive modalities that can reach there. So in particular, uh, our TMS can reach uh, the motor cortex area and then uh, direct transcortical uh, uh, transcranial cortical stimulation as well. And the one we're used to is the cortical stimulation uh, directly through a craniotomy. Most people place the paddle uh, on the epidural space, but uh, occasionally subdurally as well. And the me mechanism of action, a little bit like I showed in that model, is a very broad uh, modulatory system, right? So it's very not uh, something that we would think about originally that stimulating the mortar cortex can actually modulate pain. Uh, but through the uh, circuit the connecting the, the uh, mortar cortex as well as the thalamus and the cortical areas with the limbic system, uh, that's how, uh, again, it's thought that the motor cortex can modulate the sensitivity of the thalamus to incoming stimulus and to determine whether or not a sensation is going to be perceived as painful or not. And so the general idea is that uh, there is antidromic modulation of the corticothalamic uh, pathways that does affect how the thalamus responds to uh, the sensory system. And uh, it's thought also that the activation of the motor cortex leads to descending pathway modulation uh, to essentially stop or help stopping the um, uh, painful stimulation to inside the brainstem of the spinal cord. Uh, and there's also more of a widespread uh, network-based activation from the motor cortex stem uh, that leads to influence on the affective as well as the cognitive aspect of pain. Uh, one of the study uh, that I thought was really compelling was this one here where Essentially, they look uh, with uh, PET scan uh, technology on the uh, availability of opioid receptor um, pre and post motor cortex stimulation. And so what they highlighted here with all those uh, uh, high hotspot and uh, red circle areas were those areas where after motor cortex stimulation, there was less uh, opioid receptor availability than before uh, motor cortex stimulation. And the authors believe that that shows uh, essentially that there is more endogenous opioid release uh, from the uh, periventricular gray area that then occupies those receptors. So then, you know, uh, overall it leads to less pain. But what I wanted to point out is that not, not only, uh, you know, motor cortex stimulation seems to be acting through the uh, opioid system, but if you look at it, it's affecting very broad network-based regions. So like the periventricular gray, obviously, but also uh, the cortical areas and some subcortical areas as well, and even the cerebellum. So it's not just, you know, you're affecting the motor cortex, it's modulating the thalamus and that's it. So it's got a very broad uh, activation of, this, of the, um, uh, affecting the pain pathway very broadly. Uh, so sp looking specifically at RTMS, uh, the idea here is to deliver it over consecutive days. So about uh, the patients would come in for a week of time every day. Uh, and then they would receive a thousand pulses uh, at about 10 to 20 hertz uh, to activate the system. Um, the authors are saying that only the figure of eight coil seems to be the one that's working and you have to position it in such a way that uh, the figure of eight is uh, along the intermospheric fissure uh, rather than transverse. Uh, the key point for us here in neurosurgery is that, you know, RTMS could predict uh, whether or not the patient could respond to motor cortex stem. So one of the frustrating thing with pain is if you do have, you know, let's say 40, 50, potentially 60% of the patient that do have a uh, positive response to the therapy, it's still uh, significant since those patients are at the end of line. Uh, but it would be great if we could eliminate the 40, 50%, you know, that won't respond to the therapy so we don't have to subject them to the surgery. Uh, so what I like about uh, motor cortex stim is that we do have that option of using RTMS to predict uh, potentially a response in, in most of the patients. And if it doesn't work, then we can move on to subcortical structures. Uh, so it, the literature shows about a 35 to 60% of good response. And in their hands, a good response means 30% reduction in pain. So it's pretty modest, but uh, still for those patients, it's significant. Uh, in our hands in neurosurgery, so 40% reduction in pain is what's considered uh, more substantial. Uh, most, most people look at 50% or more reduction in pain. Uh, and then the response rate of motor cortex stim is, is described as 40 to 60% of all comers. Uh, so this is just a slide here showing uh, what it looks like. So you do a small craniotomy over the motor cortex, uh, placing uh, one by four paddles, so in this case two leads. 
so oftentimes, you know, the technology derived from spinal cord stems, so Medtronic resume leads or uh, competitors from Boston and, and St. Jude. Um, the, uh, the way to find the motor cortex stem, nowadays we have a lot of options, so we can use uh, neuronavigation and neuroanatomy. And the idea is to confirm it also with phase reversal intraoperatively with neuromonitoring. Uh, to the, the stimulation parameters are at low frequency, uh, so 40 hertz, and then a relatively medium-sized pulse width at 90 microseconds. And uh, uh, the idea on the amplitude is uh, what I like to do is to actually find uh, the threshold when the patient starts having a little bit of contraction, uh, contralateral. And so that tells you the max amplitude for motor activation, and then you go at 50% of that. And so that's usually a good amplitude to start them. Uh, so then moving on to some of the DBS techniques uh, for uh, chronic pain, uh, probably one of the most commonly used uh, target is the sensory nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, so nowadays the VPM, VPL, so there's different names in the literature. Um, and again, uh, if, what I tell my patient is that about 50% of the patient will have a significant response described as 40 to 50% reduction in their pain. Uh, so I think one of the most important thing uh, in uh, determining a good uh, patient for pain is to set expectations up front so that people don't think it's gonna be a miracle cure. Uh, and the second thing is also to make sure that uh, psychiatric and psychological comorbidities are properly addressed. Uh, so oftentimes patients will come with significant depression or anxiety disorders. Uh, and so it's important to make sure that they have a psychologist or psychiatrist on board following them uh, and that their uh, conditions are well treated and optimized medically. And I also tell the patients to make sure that they have scheduled appointments around the time of the surgery because we oftentimes see post-op uh, deterioration on the psychological state just from doing the craniotomy, from having uh, disappointment with the initial response and stress related to undergoing the surgery. Uh, so oftentimes you'll see some deterioration and so it's important that they have someone to speak to uh, somebody who can potentially adjust their meds uh, to make sure that they don't get in trouble perioperatively. Uh, the thalamus is mainly used for neuropathic pain as opposed to uh, nociceptive pain, so neuropathic pain, uh, so phantom limb, uh, nerve damage, uh, diaphragm pain syndrome, uh, as opposed to nociceptive pain, like uh, inflammation-related, arthritic-related type of pain. Uh, so VPL, VPM, so usually neuropathic, uh, when you go in the OR, you place electrode. Typically, uh, to confirm it with the patient awake, you want to see some paresthesia over the area of interest. Uh, sometimes the patient will report a sensation of coldness or hot uh, over the area. And so that's usually uh, predictive of a positive response. And something that's been shown also to be positive uh, for a positive, sorry, predictive of a positive response is an insertional effect, so similar to movement disorder surgery. Uh, meaning that the patient will report uh, for the first couple of days or a few days that their pain is reduced over the area uh, that's painful. And uh, generally speaking, the coordinates uh, are about 12 to 16 millimeters lateral um, and at the level of the uh, ACPC and just slightly anterior to the uh, posterior commissure. Uh, so essentially, it's uh, slightly posterior to the targets that we use for tremor. And the stimulation parameters are a lower frequency than what we typically use in movement disorder, uh, broader uh, pulse width, and uh, relatively uh, low to modest uh, voltages. And I just put it there, uh, the somatotopic organization uh, of the uh, thalam sensory thalamus uh, with the face located medially and then the rest of the body laterally. Um, the periventricular gray is the one that we use for nociceptive pain, uh, so burning, itchiness, uh, inflammation, and it's essentially just medial to uh, the VPM, uh, so very close to the third ventricle. And uh, surprisingly, it's also uh, organized into a somatotopic organization, so there's no true confirmation of that in the literature, but a few case report suggesting uh, that the head is located caudally inside the nucleus and uh, the feet are located uh, rostrally. And it's also, uh, the laterally, laterality is also important. So if you wanna treat somebody with pain on the right side, it, you have to place the electrode on the left. Uh, the programming is very different with a very low frequency of stimulation. So we're trying to drive that network forward uh, to bring more endogenous opioid production. 
with again a broad uh, pulse width and uh, predict the predictive uh, sensation there is a sensation of warm over the area of interest of the body. Uh, so this slide here shows, you know, our current knowledge of tractography on the PVG. And the only thing I want to point out is that we have a lot of work to do to narrow it down so that we can see the somatotopy a little bit more clearly. So you can see it's very broad. Uh, there's nothing in here. We cannot place a DBS target based on this information. It's too broad, but there's a lot of work that hopefully we can do with Dr. Bari. Um, this slide shows a meta-analysis uh, of all the... Uh, uh, cases of PAG, PVG uh, performed in the UK, so a large, sorry, a large uh, number of cases that they took out. And you can see here percent success upward of 80%, uh, 70%. Uh, but the caveat to this is when you look into that literature, what they define as a success, it's very flimsy. Uh, so they don't describe a percent reduction in pain. So it's only purely what the authors describe. Okay, so the patient had a successful response, uh, period. And so... Uh, it's very unclear what it means for the patient if they truly felt that they were improved or not. Uh, so these are some of the results in our hands. Uh, so closer to 30 to 50% response in all comers. And you can see in the third column there under condition, part of the problem that we have is that we have uh, relatively uh, few patients and the conditions that they come to see us for pain is very broad. So it's hard to summarize and come up with um, an overview of our results because the conditions are very uh, varied. Uh, so it comes to the all comers across the board with different pain syndromes. And this is not only what the results look like in our hands. And if you look in the literature with larger studies uh, published, uh, usually they include many different uh, painful conditions as opposed to like restricted to post-stroke pain for a sense or uh, post-herpetic pain. Uh, we did a little bit of DTI results so that was very early. And uh, on the left side, it was a patient who had a cortical uh, infarct. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, the patient on the left side had a trigeminal neuralgia that was unresponsive to other modalities. We placed a VPM electrode and actually had a great response uh, with more than 50% reduction in pain. On the right side, the patient has a digerine receipt syndrome with thalamic uh, stroke and uh, had uh, essentially no response to the stimulation. And what is this highlights is that if you do the DTI, there's very few fibers to stimulate uh, on the patient on the right side. So in retrospect, uh, there's potentially no normal circuitry there, or very abnormal circuitry to stimulate. So it, 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 was, it, it could be predicted that you're not gonna have a good response with that type of strategy. So this patient would, may have been better with a motor cortex stimulation, for instance. And so the idea that I want to show here is that potentially with more advanced neuroimaging, we can individualize the target to define which patient is gonna do better. And so I'm over time, but I just had a quick uh, case study with a 60-year-old uh, that we recently performed <coughs> who had trigeminal neuralgia, underwent uh, several rounds of therapy with SRS and prior MVD. Uh, following the MVD, she essentially experienced a deafferent pain syndrome. Um, and uh, uh, was unresponsive to any type of medical therapy. Uh, and so her pain was a mixture of neuropathic and nociceptive uh, painful sensation. So we opted to place uh, both PVG and VPM electrodes, uh, so close together in the thalamus. Um, the MER for the PVG is very quiet, so like very few uh, neuronal activity. Uh, but surprisingly, the MER for VPM was extremely active, uh, and I think that it potentially could show abnormal receptive fields uh, that are easy to trigger. Um, and so that's not something that's been reported that frequently in the literature, but I think it, it, could, uh, it, it could be something that we could look a little bit more closely. Uh, but again, we stimulated her intraoperatively at uh, the parameters that I previously described, and she did have uh, a sensation of paresthesia, a uh, sensation of coldness over the face. At higher voltages, she started feeling an unpleasant uh, type of pulling over the face, and we had to pull back. Uh, so I'm just going to skip um, on a new targets. So you may have heard uh, hypothalamic DBS uh, for uh, cluster headaches that have 50% responders. Uh, so it seems to be promising, but again, still very early uh, in, a, in uh, the uh, reports. 
Uh, there's only a few case report of anterior cingulate cortex, so there's still a lot more research to do, but uh, historically that was a target that was used uh, for lesioning for patients with uh, cancer pain. Uh, and so finally, just the last slide in conclusion, I, I believe that DBS uh, and motor cortex stimulation have shown uh, historically benefits. Uh, we do have problems to, with predictability, so to identify those patients uh, that will respond to the therapy will have a good response. Uh, and so I think that the way forward here is to use robust uh, models of pain that are going to be able to uh, help us out at defining better targets and also to individualize those targets for the specific patients based on their symptoms and potentially based on how their neuroimaging looks. So on that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.